Um, thank you, Dana, and thank you, Nick, for joining us today. It's a, a pleasure to have uh, Nick here speaking to you. I've known Nick for, gosh, I'd have to think about it, a couple decades at least, I think, uh, back to our time together at, at NCSA. Uh, so now he's with the, the Network Engineering Group at ESNet, which I think he's going to tell you a little bit more about. And then before that, when he and I met each other, he was a, a lead network engineer at the University of Illinois um, and also NCSA. He's also worked for some other groups um, such as the National Association of Telecom Officers and Advisors. Oh, he was the architect for their, their broadband project of the year, the, the, UC, the UC2B. And, um, He's also worked on the, the supercomputing network, Cynet, on a couple uh, of occasions. So with uh, no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nick here to talk a little bit about uh, Science DMZ architectures and securities security, which is a, a really important element in uh, cyber infrastructure for supporting science. Nick? Ah, thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me as well. Um, so like Vaughn said, we've known each other a very long time. Um, all roads seem to lead back to NCSA <laughs> for, for a lot of my connections. Um, but uh, right now, I'm, uh, as Vaughn said, I'm, I'm working for the uh, Energy Sciences Network uh, and I'll explain a little bit what that is. Um, and I'm going to talk about science CMZ architecture and security. Now this slide deck is, uh, you know, I'm not the only one that's put this together. So, you know, all credit where it's due. Uh, Eli Dart, and Michael Sinatra both have some significant uh, um, contributions to this. So as you can see, I've, I've sort of noted that there so that they, so that it's uh, clear that this is all, all isn't mine, right? This is all everyone's. Oops. Okay, so why am I here and who am I? Von mostly talked about who I am, uh, a little bit more of the, uh, you know, biography here. Um, I'm actually a member of the architecture team at, um, at ESNet, which has close ties with network engineering. That's where I was for a very long time um, in the network engineering uh, team there. Um, I've got a fairly significant amount of experience with really all kinds of networking from carriers, you know, international carriers to big campuses and enterprise, um, as well as HPC systems, um, both operational security, architecture, uh, uh, operations, uh, and engineering. Uh, and I've designed and deployed uh, a fair amount uh, of large architectures like that, and uh, a handful of which have included a science DMZ, um, and uh, was one of the first ones to implement a regional science DMZ, so not just for a single campus. Uh, and I also wrote up uh, what ended up becoming sort of the science DMZ security best practices when I was at the U of I. So, talked about ESNet. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what ESNet is, it is the large high performance network that is now has an international footprint that connects all the Department of Energy lab laboratories, uh, and that includes, you know, the science labs, the nuclear labs, the research labs, and it connects all of them together over a very high performance network, and then connects them to other resources such as commodity internet, uh, university resources, and other partnership uh, locations. Uh, and it's existed for a long time. It was one of the, one of the first national footprints. Um, I think the inception was around the mid to late 80s uh, so it's it's a you know it's a it's a fairly well traveled network at this point it's got a lot of miles on it and we've, we've spent a lot of time figuring out how to do what we need to do how do we do that well it's a you know user facility it's not considered a, a, a separate entity in so much that it's a, a different from the eyes of the DOE, it's considered a user facility just like, say, Oak Ridge National Lab or Argonne National Lab. ESNet is its own facility. It just happens to be spread across the world. Um, and we provide the capabilities that we do by, you know, optimizing for the needs of the users. We do a lot of communication with the users and the researchers uh, 
both in the university space and with uh, within the DOE complex to make sure that the partnerships uh, have what they need to do the science that they need to do or to perform the actions that they need to perform. Um, and, and as you can imagine, this is, this is not exactly a simple task because moving around a lot of this data is not like, um, you know, a commercial internet or commercial network um, needs some requirements. So in order to do that, um, a few of the engineers sat down and figured out, you know, what's the best practice for moving these big, you know, gigantic data sets from point A to point B over, uh, you know, a long fat network or an LFN. Uh, so, you know, a, a network that's typically uh, much, much more um, bandwidth rich than say, you know, you would get from, uh, you know, a regional carrier or, a, you know, a commercial provider of, of some kind. Um, and in order to do this, uh, we started at where the, where the science data begins. So, you know, the instrumentation, you know, the cluster pieces, the file systems, that's sort of the point A and the point B is whatever's on the other side, which may be, you know, similar things or maybe, you know, an instrument on one side and a cluster on the other side. So we start at point A and we start working our way through the network to figure out what are the impediments of moving this around. Um, and right away, uh, one of the first things that is discovered is that the middle boxes or often security appliances or other kinds of controls are really the, the, the first point of contention. So in order to get around those, um, and I don't mean get around as in circumvent security, what I mean is in order to move the data around that type of system rather than pass through it, uh, the science DMZ was developed. And what this is, is essentially a fast path, you know, for a friction-free path, you'll hear people say, uh, for moving the data from point A to point B. So it goes around these middle boxes that are really not the right tools for the job. Um, they're more of an enterprise style of uh, appliance that just really has no concept of handling the type of data that we would push through it. I like to use the analogy of you know, trying to suck a watermelon through a straw or, um, you know, something to that like, because the, the science DMZ accounts for the fact that these are usually long flows and they're large flows. So if you think about um, how your traffic works, when you start a session, that begins a flow. And then when it ends, that ends the flow. And when you're moving a big data set around, it's very difficult to sort of break that up. So you want to move uh, that all in one flow if you, if you possibly can. Um, and so to do that, we need to be able to provide an unencumbered path for this data. Um, but as you can imagine, you know, the, the fact that it is a little bit different than this typical security architecture um, requires some forethought and a little bit of planning to, to account for the differences, right? So the science CMZ is really a security strategy in and of itself. So this is our, our uh, normal, if you go to e uh, fasterdata.es.net, um, there'll be some links at the end. Um, this, is the, this is the traditional science DMZ diagram that we use in most of our, um, you know, most of our talks. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we've got high performance data node, um, campus land is over to the right with a firewall, there's a border router and a science DMZ router sort of in the middle and the WAN is off to the left. Um, what you want to try to avoid is moving the data from the high performance data transfer node through this enterprise border uh, router slash firewall, right? So in this architecture, we've clearly avoided that, right? So you can still get to the resources from the campus land uh, along the red path, but you're not using that particular device as a transit device because you know as we talked about the uh the traffic flows are usually enough to overwhelm them and sometimes even knock them over completely uh in a lot of testing that i used to do uh what i found was that when i really wanted to test the um fortitude of a, a, a middle box i would just try to push big flows through it i would either try to push huge flows through it or a 
unbelievably high amount of small flows through it. And usually those two uh, extremes were enough to denial of service the device. So we don't want that to happen. So therefore the science DMZ is created. So in the past when I've done science DMZ, science DMZ deployments in my uh, previous job, the security, uh, operational security people tend to um, want to know more about what it is. And there's often some preconceived notions about how we're going to do things and why. Um, so it's really important to sort of point out what a science DMZ isn't, right? It's not a way around the firewalls. And most traditional uh, security operators in the enterprise space or the campus space um, are that's going to be one of the first things they think of is now you've poked a hole in my security, right? Because the, you know, the firewall is sort of the be all end all of, uh, you know, of a lot of those locations. So it's really not a way around the firewall because in a proper architecture, you, you are just taking the functions that a middle box or a firewall is, is performing and just spreading them out in different ways. So the idea is not, to get around the firewalls or to get around the security or circumvent the policy. It's to just change it in such a way that it's more conducive for moving around the science data. Hey Nick. Uh, yes. Would you like questions throughout your talk or wait till the end? Cause there's one in the chat box. Oh yeah, I'm not watching that. Uh, however you guys would prefer to do it. Um, okay. Well, I, I, I can read them off to you. There's just one. It's, could you please share what constitutes a large flow? Uh, I have a slide on that in just a second. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Oops. There it is. But I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> um, okay, so it's also what a science CMZ isn't. It's not an unsecured segment of the network. And that's really important to get out there right out of the gate, right? It's not this Wild West area where anything goes and bad things happen. Um, and a big reason for that is it's not a set and forget architecture. Just like any other uh, security architecture, you have to revisit it, you have to pay attention to it, and it needs care and feeding. Um, so why would I need this? Uh, as I talked about a little bit ago, um, researchers need to move large data sets in and out of the IT infrastructure. Uh, if you're at an R1 research facility, you've probably dealt with this already. Um, we've worked with even um, commercial entities that, you know, they need to move around big data sets with researchers. So, uh, you know, large corporations that have a research arm may want to connect to Internet 2 uh, so that they can get their traffic in and out of there to a researcher somewhere. And in order to do that, they'll need a path to, to, to move that data over. Um, or you may have a, you know, a desire or requirement to isolate scientific instruments. That's another good uh, reason to create a science DMZ because it becomes an enclave for devices such as that. Um, or you may have other high performance networking requirements that just need this kind of uh, ecosystem to function efficiently. So we talked about the large flows. Um, I don't want to put a strict definition on what a large flow is. The, the typical nomenclature is an elephant flow, and that is defined differently by different people. Um, but if you think about the way that the normal internet, you know, the commercial internet works, um, we call those mouse flows or mice flows. Um, so if you're connecting to, say, Google, and you're, you're doing a transactional search or whatever, um, that's going to be a little bit of data a little bit at a time um, in, in multiple streams. Uh, and that's going to happen, you know, over the course of the, of the session that you're in. Same thing with, let's say, streaming a, uh, you know, a Netflix movie. It's a small amount of data that gets packaged up and shipped to you a little bit at a time. It buffers, plays, rebuffers, plays, and it's creating new sessions as it does that. Whereas in a science network, uh, let's say I want to move a large amount of data from CERN, for example, a Large Hadron Collider to Brookhaven National Lab. And this is something that we, I use this example a lot because we do this. This is one of our largest uh, 
producers of traffic, um, the CERN to Brookhaven and then Brookhaven outbound because of the, the LHC data. So some of these data sets, you know, it might be a petabyte um, and it's, you know, a single, you know, it's a single entity, right? It's a single file or something. And you can't easily break that up and have it retain its, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, its structure, I, I guess. Um, you know, you can't, you, you can't break these things up easily uh, and have them stay the same. You know, the thing that always comes to my mind is where you change the, you change the result by measuring it kind of thing. So you want to move this big piece of data from point A to point B. If you do that, let's say over a one gig pipe, it's going to be, you know, a year. Um, at that point, you're thinking about shipping up a hard drive or something, um, which, you know, our, one of our missions is for the network to never be an impediment to science data. So, you know, we'll plumb 100 gig interfaces. So from CERN to uh, the U.S., we have four by 100 gig and then another 100 gig that we share uh, with um, international networks. So we've got a fair amount of capacity across the Atlantic that can get us the data from CERN to uh, the U.S. or anywhere in Europe to the U.S. Um, but you want to try to move that as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. So you want to push it, you know, through a DTN that's going to send it as it is. Uh, and that would be considered an elephant flow because that's going to spike up to, let's say, 50 gigabits per second. Um, and as soon as you start getting into that space, you start having to think about things such as how the internals of your equipment understand the flows. So in the in the old days, 100 gig could be four by 20 gig lane, 25 gig lanes inside of a piece of equipment or 10 by 10. And so you have to understand how the machine is gonna, you know, the, the network equipment is gonna uh, understand the, uh, the flow as well as how the instruments on the other side and the entire path in between. Uh, looks like I got another question in the chat. Is it only for DOE projects to use? I assume you mean ESNet. Um, no. Uh, so we connect to basically all of the national research networks that are you know, willing to connect to us. We have a very, very rich peering infrastructure. We exist in four uh, peering fabrics in the U.S. that includes, um, you know, three Equinix here, one Equinix in Europe, uh, and that gets us to things like direct. 100 gig to Google in multiple locations, um, in by 100 gig to Microsoft for Azure, uh, in by 100 gig to Amazon for AWS Compute, because moving things in and out of cloud data and cloud resources is also now a thing that we need to deal with. So there's scientific resources or scientific actions ha happening in cloud resources. So we'll connect to anyone that is within our mission. Um, we connect with internet too, we connect with the, you know, uh, NCSA directly. So it's definitely not just for DOE um, to use, but there does need to be a mission need for it. Um, so there has to be some kind of relationship there other than our commercial peerings, which we also have. Um, and that's just to provide a full suite of, of networking to our site so they can get to, you know, we have peerings with Facebook, things like that, which don't really, there's no science happening there, but they exist in the peering fabric and uh, it gets us uh, better connectivity and off of expensive um, uh, commercial peerings. That slide did not uh, complete. <laughs> I did part of this at home and part of it here. Um, so I've, I kind of explained what the elephant flows are. Um, so use your imagination to, do, you know, to, to, uh, fill out the, the most wonderful diagram of an elephant flow that you can think of, and that's what's supposed to be right here. Um, and again, if there's any other questions about the elephant flows, just throw them in the, in the group chat and I will uh, address them. Let's see, question, how do you determine and prioritize which projects are eligible to use the science DMZ? There are obvious big and long-term ones, but how about some new projects? Is there a vetting process? So that's gonna be um, 
largely determined by the policy of the site that is building the science DMZ. So ESnet as a um, as a facility does not have a science DMZ. We connect the science DMZs together uh, where they exist. So given given that. Um, that's going to be driven by the policy of the site. So um, I can talk about how that worked at the University of Illinois. Uh, we had a vetting process uh, to use the science DMZ. There had to be a reason that it would not flow uh, optimally through our normal um, egress path. Uh, we did a security audit of what was happening. There was um, ongoing engagement with the scientists and if we were able to with the, the provider of whatever the resource was on the other side. Um, and so we had a, a lot of communication that happened and a fair amount of vetting that, that had to happen before they were able to move their um, move their experiments into the science DMZ. They also had to agree uh, in writing to our security policy for the science DMZ. Um, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, it was a fair amount of, of overhead, but I think given you know, that the differences uh, and the mindset difference between, you know, an enterprise network, which a lot of them were used to having, um, and the open science network, it made a lot of sense because it sort of forced the um, education process to understand the differences. Uh, and then they had to read the security policy and agree to it so that we had some recourse if we had to turn things off or whatever, um, which never really happened. But, you know, that again it'll be largely determined by by the by the site uh, and whatever policy they can generate uh, next question what does it take to maintain given all the variables equipment flow capacity security protocols um, I'll be honest it's uh, it, it's a little bit different than how typical enterprise and campus security is done in the way that it's managed um, because you've basically taken a lot of these functions that you know you go and you buy an appliance right and you spend you know a hundred thousand dollars on this appliance and it's a magic box that does all the things um and a lot of times even if it's not the intention those are sort of deployed and then not really maintained after the initial you know it's working we have the policy and we want um and it's passing traffic and we see logs that it's blocking stuff so thinking about that in contrast to the science DMZ, the science DMZ requires care and feeding um, and it doesn't let you get away with not doing it like an appliance does. Uh, and so, you know, you have to dedicate resources to it. Um, it's a different class of equipment usually. Uh, so it'll be a higher grade uh, layer two, layer three device you've probably got a, an architecture that has a passive security tap on it, or at least one. So there's, you know, maybe a, a, a bro slash Zeek IDS off to the side, an intrusion detection system, or another Suricot or Snort or something that's actually watching the traffic in real time, uh, but it's out of line, so it's not impeding any, any flows by processing. Uh, so you have to have someone to, to maintain that. There's a fair amount of, um, automation that can happen that can make a lot of this easier um, because you're, you're pushing these controls closer down to the resources rather than putting uh, you know a resource control at the edge uh, facing the outside so it is a different mindset I've got a, a link to a video um, that is a talk that I gave at Brocon in 2014 I think that sort of lays out you know, the differences between an open perimeter network, which is what I call the science DMZ, you know, it doesn't have this like clear security appliance at the border. Um, an ISP would also be an open perimeter network because you can't really, the edges are fuzzy, right? You can't just put firewalls all around it. Um, and the video is, it's about 30 minutes long and it basically goes over like, here's, here's the traditional and here's the way you do it in an open perimeter network. Um, and it's just a YouTube video that you can watch there. I think explains fairly well the answer to that question. Um, so the motivations for doing something like this, uh, you know, in addition to I need to move science data around, um, this allows for a little bit more experimentation, not just over the network, 
which would be moving science from science data from point A to point B, but it also, in some cases, can allow for experiments on the network. So experimental protocols, um, things like MDM that aren't IP, uh, things that are crafting new protocols like P4, um, ASICs that allow you to basically construct your own protocols based on whatever your needs are and program them down into hardware. This is a safer place for that type of work to happen rather than trying to do this on your, uh, you know, on your normal um, enterprise style network. Um, and I can give you an example of a time when this, uh, when this was very clear. Um, had some firewalls at the border of the University of Illinois when I was first moved over there from, uh, from NCSA, which would have been around 2008. We had a researcher that wanted to do some of this type of work and he was working uh, in the uh, experimental protocol suites that were defined. So like, I can't remember what the protocol number was, but it was clearly marked as experimental. Um, our firewalls would blindly drop it, uh, no logging, no policy to do so, but they had made an assumption when they programmed their ASICs that this should never be in the wild, so I'm just gonna silently discard it. Uh, and it took a very long time to figure out what was actually happening. And a lot of packet captures, a lot of span ports, mirror ports to watch the traffic and things like that. It took a very long time to figure out what was going on. You know, in a, in a science DMZ environment, that would have been significantly easier or would probably not even have happened because that middle box that was making assumptions just doesn't exist in that, you know, in the, along that path. Um, so that's always the example that I go to for experimenting on the network. And, and that's increasingly, uh, you know, that's showing up much more in much more increasing regularity um, with the advent of things like OpenFlow and SDN and P4 and other uh, experimental protocols uh, such as that. Um, and again, it's, it's just another tool in the toolbox. It's not you know, better or worse than anything else. It's a tool. Uh, and you use the right tool for the job. And in some cases, this is the right tool. Um, so it's a different perspective. Um, one of my favorite sayings is when you have a hammer, everything looks like a network, right? So taking these things and just jamming them in, you know, because the vendor says that that's where they go, that will work 98% of the time, right? But there's going to be the 2% of the time, it just doesn't make any sense at all, right? Um, the hammer in this case is that, you know, is that traditional UTM, unified threat management, middle box, whatever you want to call it. That, that tends to be the, uh, the big tool in the operational security toolbox uh, in most locations. And sometimes it just doesn't make sense to use that tool. Um, and you have to think about it in such a way that you would say uh, like a PCI or a HIPAA enclave, right? Your science enclave really is just a different class of traffic. It needs a different kind of policy applied to it. And this is just, one of the things that it's required to be able to do and that's move data from A to B very fast without, you know, without something impeding it in the middle. Um, it has a different risk profile, right? It's got different performance requirements. As I said earlier, it's probably going to use dissimilar classes of equipment, right? It's probably going to need higher grade equipment to run this more carrier grade style. Um, but it, what it does have is a similar need for visibility. Like you want to see what's happening. And that's key to really any network. Uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of network it is. If you don't know what it's doing, then you're flying blind. You don't know what's happening. Um, so that's one thing that's actually similar in this case. Um, and I talked about the experimental protocols a little bit. Uh, let's see, another question, Science DMZ providing separation for network flow and different security policy, does it attract more or less attention from the adversary? Well, I think again, that's going to be highly determined by what it is that's happening. Um, so in a typical Science DMZ, you have public addressing, right? There's no address translation or it's IPv6, right? So in some cases, you know, there's really no different. 
no difference from the um, exposure perspective because in a lot of campuses they have grandfathered public address space in you know the, the truckload and so everything is publicly addressed um, and you know in a lot of locations it's also dual stacked right and there is no there is no publicly uh, IPv6 is typically public um, you know there are some things you know site local addressing and things like that but IPv6 is is meant for end-to-end -end connectivity so from the exposure perspective the the devices are probably um, more visible I guess but there are ways to sort of prevent that they may be publicly addressed but that doesn't really mean that they're any more exposed per se um, now where you may see more attention is if the address space is reused from something else um, or it's on a list that gets scanned or it's low numbered so you know you're seeing more scans go across it but realistically as I talked about the visibility aspect you should be seeing that happen right and you can do things that proactively prevent that once it you know once you notice it's happening it's pretty easy to make it stop so I think that the notion that it's um, less secure because you can see it is a stretch in my opinion um, because I really don't consider things like address translation to be security tools. Um, they're often conflated with that because you get you know a stateful box, a stateful firewall that also does address translation but really all address translation is, is a translation tool. It's never meant as a security uh, mechanism. Uh, another question if the science DMZ is being used to support experimental protocols, uh, can it be woven into grant applications? Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of the NSF proposals over the last five to seven years have actually distinctly called out science DMZ as a requirement. So like the CC star stuff um, will, if you look through those uh, solicitations, you'll see you know that they that they want the science DMZ. And one of them was actually for building a science DMZ itself. I think that was the very first one. Um, so they they definitely can and and should be leveraged for that. Um, having a science DMZ that is well maintained, well functioning, well documented, and well you know there's the support staff around it. I think only gives you an extra leg up in your um, proposal writing because you can call that all out and say, look, I'm already set up to do this research. All I need is the funding for the bits on the ends. Um, <clears throat> so the one of the things that I always like to say about science CMZs is that when you think about it, you know, when you first look at it, you might say, oh, this is so much harder than just putting in a box and walking away. But as someone who was operational and architecture focused for more years than I care to admit, in my mind, this is much more simple because I know exactly what all the pieces are because I need to see them. And so I know what the pieces are and I know what they're supposed to do. I know that a host-based firewall is supposed to block the things that I tell it to block. I know that a uh, Zeek IDS or Bro IDS is supposed to watch the traffic and alert me based on policy that I've set up. I know that my router is supposed to route packets and maybe have you know a handful of ACLs to block particularly ugly things that should never transit the public internet. What I don't know is what the middle box is that's sitting at my uh, campus border, my enterprise border, I don't know what it's doing on the inside. It's a black box. I can go and I can look up the diagrams of what the packet flow is supposed to be like. If I'm really lucky, the vendor will have those um, publicly available. They may have them when you ask for them, or they may just tell you, we don't have that, or we can't share that as proprietary. So it's a black box, and I don't like that. I don't like not having visibility into things that, I've, that, that are in my network. Um, unlike, let's say, just a simple router um, or a switch. Like, I understand how those function and I understand the packet flow generally because those are almost certainly uh, available for public consumption uh, from almost every vendor. 
but the security appliances are often considered to be secret sauce. So they may or may not have the ability to show you what the things are actually doing. And I have seen this in practice in the past where firewall modules are applied into large, you know, very expensive chassis and packets go in, they may or may not come out. And the vendor was very unhelpful in saying what was going on in there because that was their proprietary uh, mix. Um, so they didn't want to share that and it was very difficult to troubleshoot. We ended up just taking it out. Um, so in my mind, it's significantly less complicated because I can see it. Um, it's also that, you know, by, by the nature of it being less complicated and being decoupled, troubleshooting is a little bit easier, at least for me, right? Um, I can see, you know, pack it here, pack it here, pack it here, filter there. Um, so I know the traffic path and I know how to troubleshoot what it's supposed to be because I know exactly how I built it and the path that it's supposed to take. Um, and also I've seen things like stateful packet filters introduce the risk of a denial service based on an exhausted state table. So when you've got a device in the middle of the path, the traffic path, um, and it's doing stateful packet filtering, it's doing what its name says. So it's keeping state on, uh, you know, a, a series of tuples that, you know, need to be in memory while there is an active session going. It's fairly trivial if the devices aren't set up correctly to just run that state table out of resources and then it just stops working. Um, that used to be one of my favorite things to do when I was pen testing was just run the state table out and go home because uh, it was so easy to do. It's gotten a little bit harder nowadays, but it's still it's still a risk, uh, you know, that should be in the risk register if you have something in, in, in like that in your, in your path. Um, so uh, you asked earlier, you know, what are the, you know, what how do you do these things? Are they more complicated or, or uh, whatever the question was? Um, so here, here's sort of a breakout uh, of how I see it. Um, you know, and here's the, the, the functions, right? So you control this policy and, and, and accomplish it in different ways, but the outcome is, you know, functionally similar, right? So state, stateful packet filtering, you know, you do, um, you, you, can, you can handle that in two different ways, right? You can only announce the routes that are in your science DMZ to the public through that path, right? So if, if you're familiar with how um, typical routing works is the, um, most, the most specific route in a routing table will always take precedence. So if I have, um, let's say, you know, a big block of addresses, a slash 16 of addresses, um, I'm announcing that at my campus border, right? Because that's, that, you know, that's the main path. But if I've got a slash 24, you know, which is a small subset of the 16 that is in my science DMZ, I can announce that slash 24 to my provider, Internet 2, ESNet, whoever, my regional provider, um, from that path. And that will always be the preferred path for that traffic because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a more specific match. So you can, sh you know, shorten your, or, or, uh, you know, reduce your your footprint and your exposure by only saying uh, I have these resources, but not these over here. Uh, you can also create static access control lists for the, like I said, the things that are sort of egregiously bad you shouldn't see, uh, and that's all performed in hardware. So it's typically not performance impacting at all. Um, for visibility. You know, to get around uh, the uh, need for an IPS, an intrusion prevention system, or a UTM, which is sort of a new buzzword uh, name for that, unified threat management, you put a passive tap in. This can be an optical tap, it can be a uh, span port on a switch or a router, so like a mirror port, um, or however you uh, can accomplish it. And then you put an IDS off to the side, and it accomplishes a very similar uh, task. Um, and to get the, the blocking functionality that you would see in an IPS, you can you can uh, you can employ real time black hole routing, uh, which is very well traveled. Um, there's lots of guides on how to do it. I, I've even written one on how to do it. Um, there's lots of software that you can use to make it easier. 
and it's also done in hardware on the equipment. So again, not performance impacting because it uses simple routing to do these tricks. Um, and the last part, you know, you probably should be doing regardless of if you've got science DMZ or not, right? You should be automating all the things that you can, uh, central management of accounts, uh, host-based firewalls, patching. These are things that are sort of automation 101. Um, and you just continue to do those uh, in your science DMZ. So if you think about the risks, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, risk is um, risk-based or control-based security. So most security experts are gonna prefer risk-based security. This is how we do things at ESNet. We have a risk register for the things that we're doing. Different projects have different risk registers and then they plug into a master um, and it sort of lends itself into the control-based security, right? Because if you understand the things that you're doing um, and the things your network is supposed to be doing and what the policies are, you can evaluate the risks and then you can build your control-based security based on those risks. Um, and this is what I always recommend doing. Now, there's a reason that a lot of folks don't go this path, right? And this is what I recommend for science DMZ, uh, you know, is evaluate your risks, right? Because you want to know what's happening. Um, but a lot of folks, you know, it's, it's hard to do. Um, and I'd be, you know, lying if I said that I didn't start doing risk-based stuff until fairly late in my, you know, the last probably eight years or so of my career because it was much harder and it was more tedious to do. So, you know, as it says here, risk-based security is pretty difficult to do and you have, you have to keep up with it. It's not, again, it's not one of those things that you can just do and then forget. Um, the big reason for that is the actual risk assessment is hard. Uh, you have to average that across a handful of different people to really get sort of the, the median um, assessment, right? Because some people are gonna be much more risk averse than others. Um, and it's also hard to determine if a risk is actually being mitigated. It's harder, it's harder to say this risk is being mitigated than this access control list or this firewall filter is working because I see the counter incrementing. Um, but this is a, a, one of the things that we like to throw out there as, as important to think about as you're, as you're uh, sort of kicking around the idea of, uh, of a science DMZ. Standard practices will still apply, as I said. Um, it's the same, but it's different. Um, you're not creating something that is completely outside of the norm, right? You still have to think about things like good design, right? Use your standard design methodologies. And the science DMZ itself is pretty well documented. Um, we have a web page that I've linked to that sort of calls out, you know, here's the important pieces. Um, but you have, still have to think about things that you should be thinking about anyway in any network architecture or design, you know, things like segmenting your network. How do you want to segment it? What segments have? What policies apply? Where are the risks lie inside those segments, uh, et cetera? Um, you want to be able to see the traffic. I, I, I can't say this enough times. I know I've said it like 15 times already, but knowing what your network is doing is paramount. Um, so to get that, you want to instrument all your network uh, equipment and network traffic paths, right? So Personar is what we typically um, recommend for doing that, but it's also a tool in the toolbox. Things like graphing all your interfaces, graphing your CPUs, understanding what routes are in the route table. All those things are important to understand because when you know what it normally is, you know when it's not normal. Um, and then apply the principle of least privilege, right? So when I, as I said before, you know, we had uh, at U of I, we had a document that the researchers had to read and agree to, right? And then they gave us their feedback that said, here's what, exactly what I need. And we gave them exactly what they needed. If they needed more, they came back to us and we gave them more. We gave them only the, the privileges in the network that they had to have and only the resources that they needed. Um, and that made it much, much easier to manage. It was a little bit more overhead but it saved phone calls in the middle of the night. It saved, you know, possible security exposures. A little bit of extra work up front to do these things will pay dividends. Um, 
so the links I was talking to uh, are talking about um, all here. The Science DMZ has a very good write up um, on our webpage. And you know, the Science DMZ security, which is largely based off the stuff I did at U of I, is also linked there. Um, and then uh, the best practices for securing an open perimeter network video, uh, if you can suffer through another 30 minutes of my voice, uh, is got a fair amount of reasonable information in it, and the slides are also included there. Um, ESNet has an engagement team, uh, and their job is to work with the scientists and you know figure out the best mechanisms and the best resources uh, to make available. That's their email address there, engagement.es.net. There's uh, four or five folks in that group, uh, and they are happy to help. And then my email address. Also, if I can answer any questions, I will do so and be happy to. Any other questions? Thank you, Nick. Um, happy to take more questions in chat or, or verbally. What are the common tools used? So, I can tell you what my my preferred uh, toolkits are. Um, oh, DTN. So DTN is typically going to be Globus, I think. Um, the DTN is a tad bit outside my wheelhouse, so I don't want to answer definitively. Um, Eli would probably be the one that would have that answer off the top of his head. Um, but my guess is it's probably going to be Globus, and I believe there was one more. Um, can't remember what it was. Uh, so what does it take to set up a science team? But so if you if you need the answer to that question, um, I can get it for you. Uh, just shoot me an email and I'll I'll follow up with Eli and make sure that I'm right. Um, so what does it take to set up a science team? Z? What resources are needed? I think that's going to depend heavily on what your needs and requirements are. Um, so. Let's just say, for example, you want to do high energy physics uh, research. That's one of the more common ones. Um, so you're going to need connectivity to a research network, first of all. Um, if you're at a university, that's going to be on it too. Um, and then, you know, they'll hand you to the right folks. They'll hand your traffic off to the right paths to get uh, where it needs to go. Then stepping in, you'll need a device to terminate that connectivity to um, your research network provider on. Um, that's going to be, you know, probably a hundred gig device, depending on what your needs are uh, for traffic movement. Um, it can be a switcher, it can be a router. Uh, we typically um, deploy, I've seen routers deployed, I've seen switches in a few places, but I think a router is probably the right uh, way to go there. And then you need all of the support of the structure behind it, right? All the tools to do, um, the traffic dissemination internally so uh, and, and watch the traffic so like personar device um, if we go back a little bit you get a real high level All right so science DMZ router DTN personar two personar nodes um, and then a router that can terminate the equipment I've also seen this broken out where the border router there's two of them and one of them is dedicated to science and one of them is dedicated to enterprise networking. Um, but there's no really set in stone exact way to do it um, as long as it meets the needs and requirements that you, you've set up. Uh, let's see, if a new, I assume you mean DMZ is set up, does it have a say in what passes through it or does it take whatever is assigned? Um, Again, that'll be based on what traffic you send it and what the routing policy is that's put in place. Um, I have seen locations where it's it's uh, you know a little more traffic going through it than probably should be. Um, you know, you don't want to end up with my whole network as a science DMZ, which I've seen before because you know it's easier to do it that way. Um, you need to discover and, and sort of ascertain what your what your policy needs to be for moving the science traffic 
and minimize that to whatever it exactly needs to be and really no more. Uh, or else you risk infringing on the security policy of the rest of your network. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Any other questions? Let's see, my estimate, what percentage of universities should have science DMZ but not have, but don't have one so far? Well, any, it really any, it's not just a university, really any place that needs to uh, collaborate on science would probably benefit from having a science DMZ. Um, the hardest part in my experience uh, has been uh, or what I've seen is dedicating the resources to do it, uh, dedicating the resources to run it. Like it's not that hard to build one um, and getting, uh, you know, capital expenditure money tends to be easier than getting people money in, in the university space, at least in my experience. So the impediment is typically, you know, we don't have the resources to, to run it um, because building it's one time pain. Um, and buying it is one time pain, but operating it is ongoing um, resource requirement. So that's, that's always been the, uh, the, the limiting factor from what I've seen. Um, but I would say any, any institution that wants to do collaborative science would benefit from having one. Now, how many of them actually do? I think that number has grown significantly in the past like two or three years, especially with the National Science Foundation's um, solicitations that I've done that, that have one helped to fund them and two um, really leveraged them as part of the requirements for, for building the, you know, for, for funding um, because they, you know, they, they, want to, they want these things to succeed, right? And this is one of the tools that helps it succeed. Oh, well, thank you very much, Nick, for, for having, for uh, joining us today and um, giving the overview. Really appreciate it. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left, and I'm going to um, just give the, the fellows a quick update on the Cybersecurity Summit and then maybe take a couple questions. So um, I just pasted a link into the chat for the summit. So this is October 15th through the 17th. And it's going to be in San Diego this year. And um, part of your, your fellows uh, covers your travel to this. Uh, the, this, unlike, uh, difference from between this and PERC is this is security focus, as you might guess from the name. So that everyone you meet here will be focused on cybersecurity for um, scientific infrastructure and NSFCI in some particular way. It's a two and a half day event. The first day is going to be training and workshops uh, that'll be selected by the PC in, in the relatively short order. Uh, I think that's encourage you to attend that if you can. It's a great opportunity to get more in depth in some of the things that you're seeing here in the, um, in the fellows. Then there's a day and a half of a plenary on the 16th, 17th. We wrap up by noon on the 17th. Uh, which allows you to either enjoy an afternoon in San Diego or possibly get home. And um, once again, uh, you talked to, to Dana, but I can imagine working you into to that program if you're able to there. And if not, you'll get to hear experiences um, from all sorts of different community members on their scientific uh, work, the science and cybersecurity work. And um, I was asked by one of the fellows whether or not you can submit to the summit. There's a call for participation open for just slightly under another week. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. So if you've got something you want to, to cover um, and present to the group some work in progress, and we'll probably have everything from lightning talks to, you know, full probably half minute talks to also panels and uh, very much encouraging, encourage you to, um, to feel free to to submit as you see see best on that on that side. So with that, let me um, stop there and Ron, see if there are any questions. 
Yeah. Well, uh, having you here to answer this question for, for the summit is great. So um, who, who, in, in uh, your organiza organization of this San Diego one, who, who do you think will be the audience in that summit? Is uh, it, go ahead. Is, is it the NSF people? Is it the uh, academic people? Is it industry people? A mix of above? Uh, um, can you give us an idea that can help us decide what when we submit anything content wise and also that whether it's going to conflicting with uh, the fellow if you plan for any fellows panel anything like that uh, let me answer the first part of your question and then I'm not and then uh, come back to the second part so the main part of this audience will be cybersecurity professionals working on NSF projects so IT and cybersecurity professionals will be the bulk of the audience then there will be a mixture. There'll be a, uh, probably a couple or a few NSF program officers there, uh, a few researchers um, outside yourselves, and then a few other folks. We'll have some folks from ESNet, maybe some folks from NIH in the past, um, so folks from other communities to bridge. And, then, and sorry, I didn't understand the last part of your question, something about a panel. Yeah, so uh, for us, you say that you support our travel there. Do you want to ask us to kind of have a panel similar to the perk or is this something are we committed to a certain part of the the summit i i don't know dana do you have any any thoughts on this uh i i if yeah i think it'd be great if we did a like a panel of lightning talks from the fellows or something like that we can right. talk about that i think um I, I, I'm just coming down from PERC, so I haven't had a chance to really think about this, but I think it's a great idea. Well, let's get that submitted. Mm -hmm. but the, the reason I ask is that if I were to submit something about my work, my research work, uh, I want to see whether there's going to be overlap to the other thing, um, if there's a panel. Right. Um, but, but I think you already answered my question. I, I, I will see whether I can submit something outside of the panel if you have one. Yeah, I, I think feel so cons, consider yourself as being submitted for a lightning talk inside of the panel. And then um, uh, then if you want to submit something longer, you should feel free. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're almost at the top of the hour. Is there a last question? All right, thank you all and, and uh, talk next week. And certainly if any other further questions come out, just like Nick extended the offer, feel free to drop me an email. Have a good week all. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for having me.